break and we're moving on with a Moby and our next talk topic is going to be about digital advertising. I'm going to first introduce Ross Bundy, who I've known the entire time. I think I've worked on the research park. He's been a part of the research park through its whole history. And a, a large time of that has been at a company that was called Turn, and then that became Amobi. And interestingly, he's going to introduce you to Larry Lowe, who had started his career at Turn back in 2008. So I think almost the whole history of the company. And he's joining us from Mountain View, California. The company is based in the Bay Area, but has had an office here in the research park led by Ross with a team of engineers. And this company has always been interesting to me, as I said, my whole history of the research park, I've maybe worked with Ross, but before that I worked in advertising. So nice to hear about this topic today. The industry has so greatly changed and many of us experience that as consumers that are fed ads through different platforms, but really the way that those ads are served is really complicated and takes a lot of data science. And Larry and Ross will tell us more about how a Moby behind the scenes is sharing content with you. Ross. Great, thanks so much, Laura. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm excited to be here today. Um, in the research park, I actually wear two hats. Um, I'm a senior engineering manager at Amobi, and I'm also the site manager for the Amobi Innovation Center, which is located on, on the University of Illinois Research Park campus. So um, that's a great place. I've enjoyed being here. Amobi has been in the research park um, for nearly seven years now, um, but I have been fortunate to work in the research park since it opened in 2001. Um, I've worked with Motorola, Yahoo, Riverbed, and Turn, which was later acquired by Amobi, um, all within the research park. Um, I've had opportunities to engage with corporate site directors, professionals, faculty, staff, and students some of the brightest and most talented people in the world um, without leaving the campus of the University of Illinois um, and have been privileged to have some of the same opportunities while working with the companies that have sites in the research park. And Larry is one of those brilliant and talented people. So I was interviewed by Larry when I, I started with Turn, um, again, which became a Moby and I was impressed with his knowledge and demeanor. Um, he was a pillar um, within the business before I arrived and he, as he remains today, um, well-respected across the company, influencing and leading many initiatives, including his current focus on how Moby will operate within the post-cookie world. Um, as VP of Engineering, Larry oversees Moby's data engineering, including data lake, streaming, custom audiences, and reporting. Before his management role, Larry was an architect and tech lead at Turn and was responsible for bringing a then relatively new technology called Hadoop into the tech stack. Prior to Amobi, Larry was a senior software engineer working on uh, web analytics at Digital River, an e-commerce provider. Larry holds a bachelor's in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley and a master's in computer science from Stanford University. And I feel very honored today to have Larry address us. And I believe that you will find him both knowledgeable and engaging. Um, so Larry, it, it's your turn. All right, thank you, Ross, for that great introduction. And also thank you, Laura, for being so hospitable. Um, uh, give me one second. I will, I am going to share my screen. Uh, this is a little bit embarrassing. Apparently, it forced me to. Uh, oh boy. Apparently, so anyway, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is digital advertising as it's going to evolve, you know, in the near future. All right. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about digital advertising and post cookie world. What that really means, you see, um, but that's definitely there's a there's a lot of ground shaking things that are happening currently and in the near future that will fundamentally change how digital advertising is going to work and a movie is obviously in the thick of it um and that's part of the interesting the exciting part of it there's it's a little bit also a little bit you know a little bit scary but you know with with as well changes it's just a little bit scary and it's also a little bit exciting at the same time but before I go down that path, I'm going to talk to you a little about some of the core terminology about 
digital advertising because you know we'll be using a lot of these terms and it only makes sense i think for us to be able to say something about it um <clears throat> so here you see basically the three entities and i'm not going to use a person or a corporation just entities things are interacting on the web that um, kind of make up the the ecosystem so to speak um we have what we call the consumer the publisher and the advertiser and the consumer is basically all of us right you and me and what we're really what we do on the internet really right at the end of the day right is to consume content so for example right i would i could go to the new york times or what you know what's your journal and, and consume some news I can go to youtube and consume some videos i can potentially go to you know, Twitter and consume some social media. So all of these are what we call publishers. And also, obviously, as consumers, we also use the web to purchase certain goods. And those are not necessarily publishers, but I'm just going to say that consumers purchasing goods on the internet kind of plays into this ecosystem. So the next entity in this ecosystem is the publisher. Right, the publisher is what creates and or distribute digital content. These are the main websites, the you know, also apps are considered publish publishers, um, you know, digital television as well. You know, these are content providers, right? You you go to these entities, you know, to have you know, to have something to do, to have something to watch, right? And in return, right, the publisher monetizes his content, you know, in one of two ways. Right, the publisher either monetizes the content directly uh, via you know one-time pay or a subscription, or indirectly via advertising. Right, and this is where you know where Moby comes in. Um, the last bit of the last entity in this ecosystem is the advertiser. Right, and Moby typically works very closely with advertisers. In many ways, you can see us as, as, as a representative. And what the advertiser is trying to do, right? They have products to sell, they have certain messages to, to, you know, to reach out to people. You know, so typically advertisers, they are either big corporations with a certain brand and they're trying to sell their products. They can also be super PACs, um, you know, nonprofit organizations, even governments, right? They have some kind of a you know, some kind of a messaging um, could be political information or public that they want to get up to the audience, right? So these are the kind of two main kinds of what we call advertisers. All right, so that's, this should set the stage for the, for the remainder of the talk. Right, so um, in the late 19th century, um, one of the pioneers in, in advertising who who own a you know one of the one of the first uh, department stores I think in Philadelphia. His name is John Winemaker. He had this very famous quote. Whether that's actually true or not, I think that it's, it's kind of a little bit more of a more of a hearsay kind of legend status at this moment. But this very famous quote saying where he said, "Half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half." Right, and this applied to the very you know, traditional advertising where things are kind of, you know, you far and forget, you put it on a piece of newspaper or you put it on the, on the billboard on the side of the street and you hope somebody sees it. And then, you know, somebody goes to your, you know, go to your, your department store and, and buy that product, right? So obviously we have moved on, right? R straight into digital age. And now, you know, we have, you know, certain techniques that we use to to kind of make this half of the half of the advertising budget to be wasted. We try to make that to be as minimal as possible, right? And so from there, we have two main techniques that, or two main categories of techniques really that we're trying to do, right? One is called targeting, right? And targeting is is what what is targeting is the intelligence, right, of choosing you know, what to show and when to show it, who to show it to, and how to show it. And we'll do a little bit more examples of that. And then we have another technique 
accepting these core measurement, right? This is essentially how are you going to determine whether your targeting or your ad decisioning is effective, right? Is by measuring certain facts that uh, that has happened after the ad decisioning. So to give you an example, right? A very simple kind of targeting could be just, you know, somebody's visiting a, 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 a car review website or a car review blog and we just put car ads, we put Honda ads on it, we got Toyota ads on it, we put Nissan ads on it. I mean, that's that's a, there's a correlation there, right? If you're consuming car content, then there's a non-zero chance you, you might be interested in buying a car. So that's a very simple kind of targeting. Um, measurement, um, measurement is basically, okay, did anybody saw that ad. So there's some kinds of measurements, you know, certain instrumentations on the on the site to see if, if how long you spend on on that ad, looking at that ad, or just being in in, you know, you didn't scroll right by that ad, you kind of stare at it for a little bit of time. Or you clicked on it, right? So these are events that we can sort of measure um, to see if, if that ad was effective anyway. So where things get a little bit interesting is or at least from a, from a general public perception, where things get a little bit, a little shady, I'm just gonna leave it at that, is that some targeting and measuring criteria and techniques, right, require cross-site user tracking, you know, by tying different touch points together. So I'll go into what that means, right? Oops, too far. So the, so in this ecosystem, right, we have, you know, we have the consumer on the left who, who, who can make a decision of, of which website to go to. So in this, in this example, right, the, the consumer goes to New York Times, but then New York Times, as part of its, you know, the website content, it's going to have all of these other um, assets, you know, you got CC pictures, behind the scenes, there, there are certain draw scripts are running. But then one of the things that it's doing is also um, using an ad platform, right? And what is to, to show ads. So what's interesting here is that the, the, the publisher can set what we call cookies, in, in, theory, in this case, a first party cookie, right? To kind of observe the consumer's journey on the site. And then, the, and then when the site uses ad, the ad server to display ads, right? It's actually the ad server can, itself can also set what we call third parties, third party cookies on, on, the, on the consumer's browser as well. And when the consumer goes to a different site, let's say site two, and site two also uses the same ad server, site two is gonna set first party cookies and, and the sites can only see their own cookies, but then the ad server in this situation can actually set cookies and see cookies regardless of where the user is visiting. Right, so there's a little bit of that disconnect because the user that at this moment may not even be aware that there's this tracker that is following it, following the, the user around the internet as they're browsing, as they're browsing the internet. So this has led to a little bit of, of um, a bit of a pushback from the browser from the browser vendors. Right, so so one of the things that is happening is this limited user tracking. So Safari, very famously, Apple very famously a few years ago came up with this, where third-party cookies are automatically disabled unless you, you manually override that. And Firefox followed through with that as well. Um, Chrome is also facing on third-party cookies in a year, right? And then there's, you know, and also there's, an, in the app world, there's something called an IDFA, which is very similar in concept. And then it's also being phased out next year. Right, and I just also want to say that this is not really a direct result of legislations like GDPR and CCPA. It's more of a browser vendor move. Um, we're not going to get into the reasons why they're doing that, but that's part of part of the uh, kind of where the direction is heading. You know, they want to be seen as a brand that's helping people with, with protection of their privacy of their own data. Um, what that really means for us is that there's going to be some major functionality losses, things like frequency cap, which is a way that we make sure that you don't see the same ad over and over again. Like sometimes when I go consume an ad on YouTube, uh, uh, consume content on YouTube, I keep seeing the same 
saying that over and over again, like maybe like 10 times in rapid succession. And that is not a very good user experience, right? And so the frequency cap is something that will, will get lost. Um, certain things like retargeting, behavioral targeting will also be a problem. problem. Attribution, um, that's also going to be a, a loss. So, you know, so that, that there, there's, a, there's some industry, you know, shaking events happening. Um, some of the some of the replacements are going to are going already be already being discussed. Um, most famously, uh, Google's Chromium uh, Foundation is having this is proposing this Chromium Privacy Sandbox. In a nutshell, the Privacy Sandbox will add decision to browsers, so and then so ad platforms can attract users. Um, there are a lot of different acronyms that they throw around. This it seems to be cluster around birds. Nobody really knows why. Um, there's this turtle dove, which actually executes JavaScript code from advertising platforms in the browser. So a lot of people are taking exceptions to that. There's something else called flock or federated learning of cohorts, right? It computes these cohorts um, for interest-based targeting based on your browsing history. So your your Chrome would be learning from what you're doing. On the web, not that Google isn't doing it already, but it's not doing it explicitly on your browser, right? And they ensure that cohorts are big enough for high individuals, which is, um, which is a good idea, right? And this is still a proposal, right? They've done some testing; they've claimed to have some really good results, but TBD. Um, I think a lot of uh, a lot of industry is not happy that Google is is what what Google is doing is perceived as a power play. Um, so another another you know part another player in this industry, uh, Creteo has you know has created this this sparrow which is turtle dove on the server that's run by a consortium somewhere. But who's that consortium? There isn't a whole lot that's uh, that's that's known right now. But what is actually come kind of moving more forward is these identity vendors, identity providers, right? And they work directly to, with the publishers being, you know, you, under the assumptions that the, the consumer has a direct relationship with the publisher. The consumer can choose what publishers they interact with. And now pu all the publishers, you know, ha as part of GDPR and CCPA, you know, they're gonna have very explicit ways for them, for the consumer to opt out of any kind of tracking. Right, so in a sense, you know this, you know the the this um, site login based identity providers is falling in 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 that in that consent chain that that's kind of that's kind of been been been, it's been very, now has been very like persuasive in the in the in the in the web right now, right? There's still gonna be some some level of cross site tracking, but at the end of the day, right, the the consumer can still opt out. So I think that that's a that's a big change, and it, it does speak to to the you know to a little bit more emphasis on data privacy. Um, the only the only other question, right, is that there's just a lot of these. You can see you know this giant list. And this is one of the many lists, uh, one of the many vendors that that we're seeing. There's coming with their solutions. There's a few that are becoming the leaders, but the problem here is that some of them are for profits. And some of them are non, you know, they, some of them aim for like an open consortium, just like uh, Critter was. So it's still a little bit unclear, you know, what's going to be a re realistic solution here, and also like if it's open consortium, who's going to fund it, run it, and if it's a, if it's a for profit, then you know, are there other, you know, other 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 conflict of interest that exists, right? And also using email address, which is personal identity information or PII means there's higher scrutiny, right? And hopefully GDPR and CCPA will kick in, you know, to make sure that these, uh, you know, these kinds of very sensitive information doesn't get, get out. So in the realistic world, right, we're gonna have some percentage uh, of, of identity providers providing traffic to, to many of these, uh, not, just, you know, not just advertisers for publishers, right? We're also gonna have some amount of Chrome traffic other other browsers may adopt that as well, but we don't know what that's going to look like. Um, we know that Chrome is already 40, 50, 60 percent of, of the browser, so we'll ha definitely have some form of that. 
of, of the privacy sandbox. And there's going to be a reasonable amount of web that's going to be untrackable and anonymous, right? Which is which is fine. I think that that's something that that we just as a, as an industry we have to we have to move forward with. Um, what Amobi wants to do a little bit, to give us a little bit of a of a preview. Um, a lot of this is under development right now. Is that Amobi in, in the past two years with um, start learning a lot from how television uh, is is approaching advertisements. You know, television traditionally relies on panels, things like Nielsen, um, that they can tell you, you know, that have heavily instrumented tele television sets that can actually tell, tell you like how certain, you know, how a, a population of the United States, for example, is consuming their television content. Um, that's moved on, right? You know, their TVs are not digital. TVs have IP addresses. TV can send, can phone home right now. So those, those panels have become smarter. And so we're taking a lot of that, some of that new new TV panel technology and applying it to digital, right? You can also think that, you know, digital with, with any kind of stable IDs can be thought of a panel. So a panel in this case is you know, a, a population, a small population that's doing very, that's that has very representative data across different dimensions, right? Consented IDs can be used to do that. You know, advertisers can also like, they, they can clean up their CRM and somehow use that as a panel. And panels traditionally good for measurements, but not so good for um, for targeting. So so what, what some other techniques we want to do to, to get to that so that we can actually target users, right? So, so a bunch of diff, plethora of different, different, uh, different techniques. We're seeing one of the techniques is called amplification. So we take this panel, uh, we look at their content, uh, what content they're consuming. Uh, we push it through a bunch of natural language processing, also also clustering techniques, and then we come up with what we call topic vector models. These are you know five hundred topics that users score against, right? And then we apply this model to a larger population and then we can classify users into specific kinds of audiences, right? Which would represent the characteristics of the original panel. Those of other things we're working on, you know, I mentioned earlier, we're doing, uh, there's a lot of different identity providers. We're working to stitch them together um, at, from a, an, on the ID level. We also have panel stitching, right? We also want to take the data, the different different panels that may have re represent the same population, but have like sort of non-overlapping characteristics or attributes, right? And we want to and, and we want to merge them together. And we we're, we're experimenting with generative adversarial networks to merge these panels. Um, if you're if you're aware of G G N, the, the most infamous uh, the most infamous example of that's deep fakes, essentially. Um, but we're using it to, to, to good cause here. Uh, we're sort of smart contextual, which is, you know, trying to figure out, you know, from certain contextual information without user information to just contextual information, what are the audiences, you know, interest groups that, that score high or no against those contexts. And then we're also trying to merge the TV and with your census data, um, trying to get a household, you know, household modeling. And then we, we, we actually mixed in digital devices to see what the, the total the total household and personal media consumption right now we can measure ads at performance across different screens that way and this is sort of how things are going to work together right we're going to add you know at decisioning is going to based on you know a mixture of unknown traffic uh chrome chromium traffic and then login traffic right we're going to use you know we're going to have to look at decision based on user level cohorts and this what we call this smart context, right? And then at the same time, we're going to use some of the login, you know, login data, the the ID providers, and the you know, and the panels, and we're going to do this, do the stitching and and figuring out, you know, extend the audiences, make smarter context, right? and then and then for measurements, you're going to rely on our partners, um, the publishers, and the uh, and the advertisers, as well as the panels, to figure out reach and attribution and performance. And then the last thing, right? You know, the last thing is there has to be a cultural shift, right? Advertisers, you know, they have to accept certain trade-offs between accuracy, reach, and privacy. When I talk to you know European colleagues um, in other ad tech companies in Europe, right, the advertisers already already expect the 80% accuracy 
as miraculous because of GDPR. So, you know, we are a little behind in that, but we need to move forward in that. And then consent, right? Consent is still a key to healthy digital advertising ecosystem, right? There has to be some kind of education across the board, right? So that consumers can make their own trade-offs, you know, between, you know, their accuracy and the relevant message. And with that, I'm done and uh, I'll happily accept any questions and thank you very much for the opportunity as well. Thanks, Larry. That was fascinating. I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the media landscape. So mostly you're talking about digital ad delivery. What does that look like now? How much of it is social? How much of it is web content, video content? What, what does that universe look like today? The, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little complex, right? Social media is, is still a big, is still a big part of our strategy and overall ecosystem strategy. But what, you know, but what we, what we differentiate between is that there's an open ecosystem and a closed ecosystem. And the social media now is considered, you know, close, a closed ecosystem. You have to directly buy from Facebook, right? So that's still, I would say that's still like, 20, 30 percent of industry, but that's that's we have access to that because you know via you know the the, the integrations we've built, but you know there's no really incentive for a lot of people to to build you know on top of that. So a lot of a lot of that ecosystem is still within you know, within the you know the social media giants. You know within the open ecosystem, right? We are you know I think we're one of the bigger players in the in the in the open ecosystem. You know, web. I think that I think web is still maybe like a like a fifty percent in terms of like 50, 60, 50 to sixty percent in terms of traffic. Um, but then, if you're talking about videos, TV and videos, like they're a smaller percentage, built, but proportionally in terms of revenue or in terms of the cost of that of video ads, those are much higher. So if we think about you know the percentage of video ads that's a small percentage but if you think about how much they bring to the ecosystem in terms of revenue that's actually a pretty substantial amount i'll say that's you know we're going to see up, you know up to 40 percent of that at some point becoming video in terms of revenue so one of the questions we had was about changing the way that tv ratings are measured so this maybe relates to the video comment mm -hmm. we're making of using yep. whether it's Vizio or other um, uh, Roku or other ways to track what people are actually watching versus Nielsen ratings. Now, the other question that I saw come up was about how click throughs or views in the digital world are just more accurate of showing whether you had an impact on an ad. So I think that's kind of two worlds. TV advertising mm -hmm. delivers more of a passive opportunity based on eyeballs or costs of impressions versus the digital world where there's an action taken by the viewer or the consumer. Can you talk a little bit about those two different worlds and how ratings differ for, for versus cost per click or other metrics that might be in your industry? Sure, I can talk about that a little bit. The 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 TV, the, the, I think the, 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 the fundamental difference is that TV is, is, is a communal device sorry a communal device so behind the scenes you really don't know exactly who is watching that tv obviously uh by looking at the time and consumption what content what channel they're looking at we can actually make some inferences about that um, but also tv is more of a panel right we're going to get a a smaller population so a lot of that is going to be inferences um but at the end of the day right you know there, there's no there's no easy way for correlating that to some kind of an action. So what we're doing, right, is we're gonna we're, we're trying to mix in the digital data, right? Any so so the theory being that okay, you you consumed an ad on television. You go to your device and then you uh, you 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 go to that website, right, or you or you or you click on something to see that that's happening. That that you're 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 going to that, you know to that product that you, that you saw on television. So we're mixing those two data sets together, right? Right now, um, we're using, you know, you know, in, in, in the case, you know, in the case of more traditional news, we're using a bunch of different 
you know, other demographic and interest based data that we got from using to, to tie that together. For some of the digital data sets, we can actually uh, use IP addresses to tie them together as well. Obviously, IP address have some implications in Europe. That's there's a there's a discussion whether that's PI or not. I think some courts in Europe have have a, have ruled that, and obviously we'll, we'll we'll have to work with that in terms of how do we make sure that the PI the PI doesn't get you know doesn't get incorrectly used. So we have lots of questions and only a minute left. So I'm going to choose a couple quickly. Um, the term panel stitching, is this something that is a Moby jargon or is this something used more broadly in the ad tech uh, world or other uh, data science fields now? Um, you know, I, I do not know. I know that um, I know that for our panel stitching, you know, we, I think that we're, we're definitely filed a patent for it because I, we feel that it's a pretty innovative. Um, but I would not. I wouldn't be surprised that this panel stitching is going to become a bigger uh, player, right, in in our industry because you know as all of these changes are going to happen, right, people are going to start losing. Um, you know, the advertisers are going to start losing their you know some some clarity into their users outside of their domain, right. So they they might engage in entities like Mobius. Say, okay, here here's my data. I would like you to mix in with this other data sets. Um, but then, you know, because of privacy concerns, we don't really have any exact way for you to merge them together. Right. So I believe that that's that's one thing that's that's we're all gonna see in the horizon. Great. Now the next question I'm not gonna have time to address. I'm hoping you'll you'll respond in the QA feature. It's a probably a big topic, especially this year about detecting biases and recommendation systems. Certainly in the political landscape right now, this has come up and we had a speaker from Carnegie Mellon at our Research Park Data Science User Group on Friday talking about this as well. So if you're interested in this, perhaps you can chat with Larry and with Ross to learn more about how biases play into recommendation systems. I'd like to thank you for joining us today we're proud to have a Moby as part of the research park and to be able to learn more about digital advertising from you, a long term leader in this field and engineering and with Ross leading our local site. Thank you.